Yo, welcome to another episode of the BJJ Goons podcast. I'm one half of the team here, Tim, the Mushmaster Spriggs. And with me, as always, every week is... Yo, what's up, everybody? It's No No Nico, Nico Ball. Happy to be back. Supposed to be with Tim at the studio, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Life shit happens, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, we got to... We, we got to get you like a new whip or we need to get you like, we need to get you, we need to get a lot more patrons on the Patreon so that we both can get new whips, you know? Yeah, I, no, not for real. I've been looking for a new car. I was actually, I'm meaning to file my taxes. The IRS owes me a lot of money. For once, the IRS owes me some scurla. Uh You know, funny thing, because like, we're going to talk about like some medical shit, but they owe me a lot of money because of health insurance. Uh, and I'm going to use that to buy a car. I just need enough money to buy a G body cutlass and then I'm happy. A G body cutlass? Yes. Google it right now. Sounds Old school G body cutlass. Yes. I'm trying to get to the studio and Tim, it sounds like you want a car that's older than mine. Cause like, you know, I drive a classic car. I got a lot of car problems, but it's cause I drive an 88 uh, Toyota MR2, which is a beautiful car. I love that car. And I don't know what you ain't. All right. You know what I'm saying? I'm, that's just a, that's just a dream I have. But you need yours out of necessity so we can come into the studio and do even more bomb ass content. I just mentioned our Patreon. Yes, we have a Patreon. We already have a few patrons, and I want to say shout out to you guys. We plan on putting out a lot of new content at least twice a month on the first and the fifteenth. Uh, shout out to all our patrons. You can follow us and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash BJJ goons. A lot of uncensored, unruly, dirty content on the Patreon. Uh, yeah, we can't. It's everything that we can't say on our regular broadcast that you're seeing right now. Everything we can't say, we say on there because we have sponsors and we have to put on a nice front and we got some really good uh, techniques that we want to show you guys on there. A lot of exclusive content. And if you're on certain tiers of our Patreon, you will get exclusive merch, which we are in the process of developing, but it takes a little bit of time. But I digress. Nico, we need to get you a new car, nonetheless. I'm shopping, I'm shopping. So, you know, if you're in the DMV area, you got a nice car, you know, four doors, something I could drive down to Atlanta with, uh, you know, I'm looking for a car. <laughs> I hate car shopping. I don't know anything about, mm, I don't want a car shop, Tim. Like, I, it's, it's bad enough trying to buy cameras and lighting and do all that. Like, I don't want to have to look for a car on top of that. Yeah, I, I've had my old reliable for a few years now and People take having cars for granted until your car stops working. And then you realize that if you don't have a working car, life sucks. <laughs> Unless you live in a major city like New York, where like the whole city is huge, but you can get to anywhere through public transportation. Living where I live, if you don't have a car, you're shit out of luck. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking for because I do live in the city. So like, I was looking forward to like going up there early, going to Panera, you got like a smoothie can, you got all that like nice suburban stuff with like parking space, you know, outside of it. Mm. Like, but I was about to, I was actually on my way to the post office because I live in DC. And I had some merch to ship off to OC, like um, our, our guests and stuff. Uh, and like, I live, I ain't gonna tell you where I live, but I live on like one number <laughs> three. The post office is maybe about like five blocks up and the mechanic, and surprisingly, cause I live on Capitol Hill, surprisingly this mechanic is super affordable. Like, cause there's a mechanic like on my block that charges like three to 400 extra for like the same thing this mechanic does. So I felt my car wasn't like gonna make it to the post office and I like bugged a U-turn and I was right there in the mechanic. I pulled in that parking lot and it cut off on me. They're like, well, you need to move your car. I was like, nah, this is your problem right now. I was like, I need a diagnostic. They're like, is your check engine light on? I was like, nah. Like, but I actually need you to check my car now because they keep trying to like tell me, oh, the dude isn't here. You got to bring it back. And I was like, no, now you got to, you got to keep it. And I walked home. 
<laughs> it's your problem now yeah i was like it's your problem i can't move it i was like you guys are amazing people i trust y'all like i'm gonna grab this light i had to take the lights and walk the lights home and i had to go back to the mechanic grab the box and take the box to the post office mm -hmm. uh, but that, like i live in the city so that was possible if i was over by your house i would have been stuck it would have been triple a wait yeah yes and the, the hard part for me was uh when i started getting money in the game i realized that you have to have insurance of course but you need to have triple a because i live so far from the gym that i realized if i'm going down the road on 495 and it's a 40 minute drive i get broke down it's a far ass drive anyway so i not only have to get triple a i have to get like gold or platinum or some shit because if you got to pay per mile if you get stranded somewhere. So I was like, shit, I just, here you go, AAA, take my money. But it's good. You know? No, it's worth it. I once had to like tow a car all the way from DC to Philly and AAA covered like most of it. And then I only had to cover like $200, but like that would have been, yo, that would have been my money out the pocket if I didn't have AAA. Yeah. The, the things we go through to live the lifestyles that we do and certain things that you'll have to go through if you live the conventional life just seem that much more stressful living the lifestyle that we lead you know it could be your car but it can also be your health and health insurance so you were saying earlier that you had some issues with our healthcare system in the united states would you like to elaborate yeah yeah so i don't know have we talked about it like on here when we talk with oc and maybe dr rosa but mm -hmm. Like on top of having like eye surgery last year, I would detach. I had a detached retina for the second time. So like I dealt with all of that. Um, I still have high eye like pressure in my eye right now. So I'm also going to like the eye doctor on top of all of that. But I've had problems with my hip or my hip flexor and been diagnosed with like before COVID with like psoas something like my psoas was popping. Um, and that's like a weird muscle that's like in your groin. Uh, and I've done like physical therapy. I've gotten an x-ray. I did an MRI when I was in Brazil, but that doesn't count with like American like insurance. So I finally, finally got like signed off to get an MRI. Um, so I finally got the, the results back from the MRI and I do have a torn labrum, which really sucks. I have osteoarthritis, which I knew about, like, and I've known about that for a year. And then now they also confirm that I have a torn labrum. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. How does that feel? I mean, see, that's the thing. Like, I, it's hard to like say how it feels. Cause like I've been in like so much pain or I've had like discomfort for like so long. It's been like a year since like 2014, maybe even before uh, I went to Brazil and it's just got kind of worse. Like, so before it was like a sharp pain in my groin. Um, and now it's like I have pain in my groin area and then pain in my lower back and it causes a lot of stiffness. So it like kind of feels like my whole hamstring is stiff going down to like my knee and like it just feels like everything's really tight. So why I really wanted the MRI because like I've always I guess I've kind of suspected it's a torn labrum for a while because that's really common in like soccer, soccer players and jujitsu athletes and from kickboxing, you know, like the stance, like the mm. way that you move your hip when you're when you're doing boxing like that, like that movement, like really causes a pinching, you know, so I, I suspect yeah. it's from like doing that for so many years. Um, and now it just feels like stiffness all all like rating up my back and everything. So that's why I finally went back to the doctor because I got a cortisone shot like right before COVID and then COVID hit and I was supposed to go back to the sports medicine doctor, but I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going back. Like I'm locking down. I'm high. Like that's where all the sick people are going to be. That's where you're going to get COVID. So it's taken me like a whole other year to like follow up. And they're like, well, the cortisone shot didn't help and the physical therapy didn't help. And like, so I had to go through all that for my health insurance. Cause I like Medicaid. Um, so I had to go through that whole process to even like get them to sign off on an MRI. So that's not a, is that like a very complicated process just to go through, just to get told that you're fucked up. Yeah, and like the worst part is like, cause I, I have a sports medicine doctor and I guess like he doesn't work there anymore. And like, I'm hoping he got fired and like, didn't get a better job. Like, cause one thing that's like, so I have Medicaid. So it's like, they send me to like Unity Healthcare, which is like 
in DC, which is like overcrowding and like they're known for not being the best. Like you can't get through to them on the phone. Like you got to schedule appointments. And like, so this doctor like didn't write the referral correctly. Um, and then, so he referred me from the doctor's office to, where was it? Howard Hospital, I guess. Um, so he didn't write the referral correctly. So like I go and I try to like schedule the MRI and like you need blood work. And I was like, what blood work? And it's like, yeah. And so I had to go back to the same doctor and like figure out how to get the blood work. And then I go back to get the MRI. And that's when I found out like that they didn't do the MRI correctly, like the referral correctly. Uh, so then I had to go back to the doctor. Like and I'm driving like all around DC for this, like and get like the correct referral, but that still wasn't the correct referral. Um, and then when I did figure out that like, think I had the correct referral, like they still weren't putting the right codes on it. So like I had to go back and forth. It took me like four or five times to like actually get all the paperwork. And the day that I came there and actually was able to get the MRI because I had to be an MRI with contrast. So I needed like this really big needle that you needed x-rays to guide the needle in. So that's what made it really complicated. Um, and I wasn't scheduling it correctly. And because nobody told me how to schedule it because like you, it wasn't calling to schedule an MRI. You had to call and ask for something else. But like this whole time they keep asking me all these questions. I'm like, these are questions only a doctor would know. Why are you asking me? Like, and I, I'm terrified of needles. So like, I'm there like crying. And then they're like, they're like, well, did you get a history? Like, I don't know, saying all these medical words. I was like, do you see the state that I'm in? Like you need, to, like you have no communication with my doctor and they like have none, like zero. It was, it was pretty bad. Our medical system is a clusterfuck. Yeah. I'm lucky that I got in contact with Dr. Rosa when I did because he's an expert and he has good people skills, which I think is lacking in the medical field. It's lacking in a lot of fields. A lot of people don't have good social skills. They don't have good bedside manner, but it's a clusterfuck. And <laughs> it is, it really is. And if you don't have someone that can guide you, you're gonna end up in that situation that you are in because we're athletes, we have different professions, we're not experts. So I can only imagine the stress you're going through just asking those crazy ass questions, let alone dealing with, you're probably in pain, you're probably worried about not only having to go under the knife, but you're afraid of needles and you're thinking about how is this gonna cost? Like, what is this going to cost me? It's when I when I got hurt and almost died, I'm lucky that I was still on my parents' insurance because they had that good TRICARE, military TRICARE insurance that I was able to go to the military hospital and get checked out. And they have top tier medicine in the military. I went to the same hospital that, that took care of Trump when he got the COVID. <laughs> I went there. I was in there for a week. Now the food sucks like any hospital, but everything else was A1. I was lucky. I really worry about people that are in the same profession that don't get paid enough to afford the good healthcare or don't have a good sports doctor that they can call up at any moment. Like we have with Dr. Rosa, if you're affiliated with Team Lord Irvin or you know him. So I'm sorry that happened, Nico. Uh, uh, that's definitely my next step like I'm trying to actually talk to him because like now I have all the results and now I've talked to like I've yelled at all these doctors and it's like uh kind of got the process balanced like I need to go find all of the results myself and like acquire them and like get mm -hmm. releases and acquire them so like now what I really want to do is talk to Dr. Rosa and see like what his advice would be because I don't have a sports medicine doctor because he left like the person mm -hmm that did the MRI then they passed me off to an orthopedic surgeon from Howard but and he gave me the results but he said I don't specialize in this stuff so he just gave me a number to another doctor who I have no idea who he is so it's like you know I just want to talk to Dr. Rose and be like yo this is what happened do you know who this doctor is would you recommend like me trying to find a different or a better doctor that you know that would accept my health insurance because having Medicaid is like an issue and it also means I can't leave the city like some of these practices in the city have like offices like that are right outside of the city but I can't go to them because of my health insurance. I think that the health insurance issue is overlooked when people decide 
to, to pursue this profession. And I'm here to tell you folks, if you're a professional athlete, let alone a professional grappler, you're going to get injured. And even if you have guys that take steroids, you're going to get injured. And you have, have people that put you back together again. And it's a huge expense. It's one of the various expenses that you will incur while doing this. But uh, I'm glad that at least you have Dr. Rosa that can help you. Hopefully we get you on the mend. I think you'll be okay, but I'm sorry that happened to you, Nico. <laughs> okay, interesting. At least I got the diagnosis. I know what to do now. Like, word from there. Well, that's right, good. So what's been up with you? Well, what's been up with me? I lost my match against Victor Hugo. It was a pretty good match. I think I could have done better. I went out there and did my best considering the circumstances. Uh, I mean, it's already been put in the public, at least on social media, that there was a small little COVID outbreak amongst the MMA guys at Master Lloyd's gym. Master Lloyd caught it, you know. Is that on social media? Yeah, they did. Yeah, he didn't see. Who? No, I didn't. Who did? Yeah, Master Lloyd put it up on social media. Oh, damn. Yeah, so he had a fight. Yeah, that's wild. So they had their own little bubble. I'm grateful that I didn't start training with them um like I didn't train with them I'm grateful I didn't train with them around that time that I may have or should have to prepare for a potential match but when I got the call to do the match it was about three weeks before maybe and I had been just doing kickboxing and in the kickboxing class you have to wear a mask so we're all masked up doing kickboxing and I'm like pretty much solo dolo outside of that you know so i ended up just missing out on getting COVID. so i'm lucky you know i'm lucky that i didn't get it but i didn't really have anybody to train with <laughs> to prepare for the match besides max jimenez yeah shout out to max jimenez shout out to max jimenez he's been my my training partner a couple of times a week here at the bjj goon studios um, he's a really great training partner, really cool guy, former guest on the show. And I got to say, shout out to you, Nico, for suggesting having him on the show, because I wouldn't have had a training partner to help me prepare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that's what I was thinking when Max moved here from like, he left like, Goot, well, I guess Goot's not there anymore, but like Dante, it's like, it's hard to find people your size. Like, maybe you don't appreciate it if you don't see Tim, like personally, like even on Zoom, it's not the same and like stand next to him and be like, Oh damn, you're a big motherfucker. Like every time I try to take pictures of them, like God, backdrops, man. Like uh, it's got to be hard because even if there are other black belts in the area, they're just not your size. He Max is huge, but he is a great training partner because he's safe. He's a safe training partner to have. He's very technical. He has a lot of experience and he's world class and he lives super close to me. So he helped me a lot. I was able to deal with any kind of stand up situations with Victor Hugo. I mean, that heel hook came out of, I mean, it came out of nowhere. Like, I didn't know I was in danger because I'm used to going with big dudes. I'm used to guys that have leg locks, but that really caught me off guard. Kind of fucked my knee up a little. So the last few days I've been resting uh, to just, you know, keep from exacerbating any issues that may be going on. But it feels pretty good. I think next week I'm going to start getting back to training. Maybe. Maybe, maybe get back maybe get back to training because I'm gonna be honest with you like I'm burned out I am truly burned out from jujitsu and I know what people are going to be saying oh well you've been on lockdown for a year yes I've been locked down for a year however I was still in the game in my mind in my heart I still was trying to make something happen for the first three months of the lockdown, I was still watching film and studying and preparing as if there was going to be a world's. I was still in my mind saying, yes, one more run. It's funny. While I was on the plane on my way to the tournament, I was bored and I, I had podcasts and I have music and I was on Southwest, shout out to Fight to Win Seth, 
for hooking me up with a nice Southwest flight and never putting me on spirit because I made a promise to myself a long time ago that if I ever had to fly somewhere, I would never fly spirit because the one time I flew there, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and I promised myself as soon as we landed that I will never, ever, ever, ever go back on another Spirit Airlines flight. Wait, what was so bad about it? I got like a membership with Spirit or something. I don't like one of them too much. Well, here's the thing with Spirit Airlines. It is a slave ship with wings. Okay. All right. I mean, it's Amistad Airlines. That's what I call Spirit. Regardless, I was looking through my pictures, my old pictures, and kind of reflecting on the year because I have a nice i have a google phone and although it's not an iphone the cool thing about google phones is that you can look at like every picture you've ever taken and i had a screenshot of notes from an episode from over a year ago and it was an episode where i was doing my new year's resolutions for 2020 and one of my new year's resolutions at the time was that i was going to lift weights and get fucking swole uh and also i was going to have one last run basically and travel around doing seminars, doing money matches, win as much as I can stack up and take a sabbatical. Ironically, I did take a sabbatical. It was a forced sabbatical and it fucked up a lot of my jujitsu business aspirations. And I came to a realization that although I was on lockdown, I had a year layoff, I, I still was working hard to try to get it to happen and I feel burned out. You know, I've been trying to make this work for the last 14 years of my life and I'm tired of it. <laughs> I sacrificed a lot. I sacrificed so much. I sacrificed my time. I sacrificed partying and a lot of people in their 20s some could argue that they waste it, but a lot of people spend their time having a really good time partying their faces off. I sacrificed a lot of that time. I sacrificed time with my family, my friends. I sacrificed career opportunities. I sacrificed, I left money on the table. I pushed off so many things that most people in that time that I spent training and trying to pursue this dream like I look at my friends now and I'm like, okay, they're kind of ahead of me in a lot of life stuff. Like I may be in shape. I may be able to kill 99.9% .9 of the world with my bare hands, but a lot of other things I'm kind of behind. And it's not to say that I regret it, but it's time for me to kind of stop pushing off other parts of my life that makes someone a whole person. And I think it's time, uh, even though- Of being ahead of you. I would say professionally, I would say security wise, living the life that I live and doing what I did the last, let's say specifically last two and a half years has not been the most secure <laughs> lifestyle. And although it is fun and although it's been fruitful in a lot of ways, I want more security in my life. We had this episode a couple of weeks ago about money and jujitsu and yes, there's money to be made, but you have to have balance. One germ, which me and Aaron predicted, and we don't want to have these powers, but we predicted one germ. Dude, so you have to step up. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, well, I had to step in and admit that I fucked the world up. Yes. I apologize everyone. I predicted I fucked the world up, but I have to step up in other ways too, Nico. Like you got to realize like a whole, a whole disease wiped out a whole season and fucked up a lot of people's shit. And then people want to admit like, oh, no, it didn't. Like, no, it did. It fucked me it up did. a lot. It definitely did. It fucked up a lot of people's shit. And then I realized like, yo, it could have been, it was COVID this time, but who knows what it could be. It could be a catastrophic injury. It could be a life crisis. And I don't want to be holding the bag again. And to be fair, I've won a lot. I've done a lot. And it's time to move on. Like, I'm tired of it, man. I, for the last month, my back has been bothering me like hell. And it's like the second worst back pain I have ever had. 
The first was when that day I woke up and I couldn't stand up straight and I was bent over like a seven and I was walking like an old man. This is next up on that. Like this is number two and it's pretty close. And this match, like my knees been, my knee was fucked up. Like I was limping, everything. And I thought, man, do I want to do this for the rest of my life to pursue titles that in the grand scheme of thing won't change anything? Like I won worlds at black belt in the gi. I've medaled at worlds at black belt in the gi. And I can honestly say it did not make my life any better. It might make me feel better about my athletic career, but it doesn't make me feel better in my life. But as far as life, life kicking my kicks my ass sometimes. And I think, damn, it's worth it. But it's like, man, I could have gone about this a way smarter way. And now it's time for me to kind of fall back from the whole competitive scene and focus more on what I do now with you, which is the podcast, which is the BJJ Goons movement, teaching people, paying it forward, that kind of thing. As far as competing though, and making it my life and my living or loving it to the point of sacrificing everything else that goes on in someone's life, it's a no-no for me. I don't, I don't think so. And another thing too, just all the trials and tribulations I've had to go through from the time that I made the choice about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago to the day that I wanted to be a professional or like be a jujitsu guy to now has taken the joy out of it. I, I Have you ever seen that Kobe Bryant short that won him an Oscar? No. Dear Basketball? I suggest you guys watch it if you're listening, but the way he talks about it and the joy that he said that he had for it, I used to have it. But now just from dealing with the bullshit, like you even said it before, like we are professional athletes, right? Let's say we as a like me or, or like a, a regular black belt, like a high level black belt, right? But we have to deal with everyday people stuff and we don't have the luxuries that other professional athletes have and dealing with that dealing with the politics, it takes all the joy out of it. And to be fair, having a professional career as an athlete in this is not joyful for me anymore. So I'm backing <laughs> off. It's a, lot of work. it's a lot of work. It's a lot of extra work. It's a lot. So I'll be focusing on teaching, breaking down matches, doing stuff for our patrons and our Patreons and always giving you guys content. But I've kind of felt this way for a while now, but definitely before the match, I said to myself, like, this is probably going to be the last one. Win or lose, it's going to be the last one for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's been like an interesting year, too. If you're not training, you're not doing things right, you know, you might as well step back and, like, focus on what you need to focus on. Like, I kind of realized that a little bit this year because, is it like so I actually have a job like I'm a teacher and then like I always train full time and I remember somebody had asked me you know like you do so much like how often do you like sacrifice like sleep or like not get to sleep and I was like well you know because I consider being a professional athlete like part of my job and like rest is important you know like I always prioritize like getting enough sleep or trying to get eight hours of sleep I never do but like you know I'm never like gonna stay up all night working and sacrifice sleeping especially if I have to train in the morning um but like this year I picked up like a second job on top of teaching. I started doing the podcast with you and then like Favela Jiu Jitsu, um, I have the nonprofit today, Kids Project and then Favela Jiu Jitsu, like we launched a new website and a store in Brazil. And I was still trying to do everything. I was still trying to like train as if like I had something to be training for. And it took me till I burnt out, like to realize, you know, like maybe I shouldn't be training every day. Like when I'm trying to launch a whole new store and like have like, it's a lot and I need to give it the time and the priority and the space that it needs. And I always prioritize jujitsu over everything else. And I just, I realized, and like, I stopped training. I haven't really been training that much for a while. And like, first it was because of work and then it was because of the injury, but it was like, you know, I still love training, you know, and I still want to get my black belt. So I feel like I have a long way to go, but I also know at this point in my life, you know, I'm not in jujitsu to become a world champion. Like I've done a lot. And I will do a lot in my life because of jujitsu. Like, I feel like I can get around anywhere, you know, like Europeans, like, um, 
and I'll be good at jujitsu and I like, you know, choking people out, but like, I also see like the career path and the money and like, I see myself as working in the industry more than being a professional athlete now, I guess. It's hard being a professional athlete in this sport or being an athlete. I'm just tired of waking up in pain and it feels like a job and it's not fucking fun no more. And if I'm not having fun, it's not like I'm getting paid millions of dollars to do this shit. Like, exactly. I enjoy, I, I, I'm enjoying teaching people, but even then I'm like, man, I kind of want to like a job, <laughs> <laughs> like a real fucking job. <laughs> I have a degree in ego. The fuck? <laughs> I mean, like, it's interesting. Like, I want to quit my real job. Like, cause I always tell people like I got a W2, a 501c3 and an LLC. And then like I do 1099s too. I'm back with the 1099s. So it's like, I'm trying to get rid of like the W2. Uh, but also like having your own businesses, it's like hard. It's annoying. Like you can never just wake up and chill. It's like, I don't have any days off right now. Like, no, know? I I would say being your own boss and living the lifestyle that we lead is like an ever all encompassing sense of doom at all times, <laughs> at least for me, just like, fuck, ah, I gotta do this, 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 this. But, uh, you know, this is how I feel now. Maybe it'll change, but probably not. You suggested that we watch a movie, Nico. Mm -hmm. You suggested a film, yeah. a documentary. Wait, it's it's been like almost a year, I guess. So a year since uh, COVID hit or in this documentary is The Day That Sports Stood Still. So it's on HBO. Um, and they give the perspective from NBA, which is interesting because it's like that when NBA called off the season, it's like that's when COVID became relevant to like the mainstream world. Like nobody mm. cared. Like people were dying, but they're like, oh shit, there's no sports anymore. Mm. So it was interesting. Did you know about when they canceled the season? Absolutely. I am a big sports fan. The last few years I've gotten really into the NBA and I remember vividly that whole week. So they glossed over it in the documentary, but Rudy Gobert, the center for the uh, Utah Jazz, for the Utah Jazz, he was patient zero. <laughs> but like, but I the don't night feel before, like they lost over it. Like the way they said it, they it's did. Like, oh, it was March 11th, 2020, 2020, like 2020. Like they got it, and it's like they canceled the game. And it's but like, here's oh, the thing, Nico. Everything managed. All right. But the thing they glossed over was the night before that we had known about COVID for at least a month. And I'm almost certain that me, Master Donnie, Jamil, and Malachi got it when we were in South Korea that winter. <laughs> I swear to God, because we came back and we were like sick for three weeks and I, that had never happened before. And I make it a point to have my emergency, my vitamin C, like my Zycam, all my vitamins. And at the time I was like, ready. I was like, I'm not getting sick, I'm fighting, like, ah. And then I came back, I was like, oh, I'm dying. <sighs> Nonetheless, the, that, the day before, I believe, quote me, don't, uh, if I'm wrong, please tell me, but the day before, Rudy Gobert was making light of it in the press conference because they had already done kind of social distancing in the post-game press conferences. And he was just like, like, touching all the microphones as a joke, like touching the table. He was like, hardy, har, har, I'm making a joke about it. And then literally like the next day, you can Google it, like, he was, <laughs> listen, like he was patient zero. And like, they, they glossed over the documentary because they didn't want to make him look bad, but he was making light of the COVID, like literally days before, and then they shut down the season because of him. And they had a joke like he should have won defensive player of the year because he shut down the whole league. She kind of did. <laughs> they really said that? He it was a joke, but yeah, he's definitely defensive player of the year because he shut the whole league down. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy, man. Uh, but it's funny. It's like, so the NBA suspended their season. Like basketball has that kind of authority that made like COVID relevant. That shows our value system in this country. Sports are our value system. 
the Black Lives Matter movement, like kneeling for the flag started from a lot of it was influenced by sports what Colin Kaepernick did. And that's when it became kind of like a national issue. And then everybody started kneeling. And what's so funny, you finally saw it, right? I watched it, yeah. It you just, watched it, right? Really just touching all of the microphones. Yes. Like yes, uh, they didn't put that in the doc. I haven't watched all of it, but I'm it, past the point. In the documentary. That's definitely yeah, there. yeah, they did. They <laughs> took that out. See, they t- see how they do. They do this. They do the story. But uh, yeah, sports is our value system in a lot of ways, and I'm I'm happy that the NBA is super progressive because I don't think the NFL would have stopped. And we're kind of lucky because after the Super Bowl, they didn't stop. Like they had parades and shit, and like if. I could, God forbid if the 49ers had won that year and they would have had a parade in like California, which was like a huge COVID outbreak center. Like it probably been worse in California, but yeah, it's a good thing that they stopped it. <laughs> so nuts. It's wild. So like also in the documentary, they had like Carl Anthony Towns from the Minnesota Timberwolves. Like, so he had come out with like this heartfelt message at like 4.30 in the morning when his mom first contracted COVID. Um, you know about him too? Yes. I know about all these people, Nico. I, I just follow. That's like, why you know, like, <laughs> like, it's like, and then everybody else is like, oh yeah, of course, you know, yeah. And it's like, you didn't see this or you didn't see that. So that was crazy because he's lost seven family members on top of his mom like so if you watch this video which they show in the documentary where he's so like positive and optimistic but also like informing people and it's kind of like that thing where everybody in the jujitsu community was like pissed off about the silence and it's like you know we don't do this to like win medals like it it does give a like it gives you a platform you know not so much in jujitsu as it does in, in in nba but like that's kind of like the message that people needed to hear more over dumbasses that were over there touching all the microphones and just being like completely inconsiderate of like the situation so like I can't imagine he had seven family members passed from COVID and then he gets COVID and sparks the 13th suspension of the NBA and it's like 13 suspensions like why do you even have a season like why are you even playing money (laughs) that's why they put their asses in the bubble because it's money if they didn't complete the season, it would have fucked the money up. But the by way the one, I think they were, it said they were in Memphis, I think. They weren't in the bubble. Did they come out of the bubble and keep playing? All right, so let's go back a little bit. I am not an NBA expert. However, I kind of understand the way the money works. In sports, let's say the NBA, there are television deals And they have to play a certain amount of games to get that television money because these television networks need the programming so they can get the ads from the companies and pay the money. It's a business. And it would have affected the players in their collective bargaining agreement if they skipped the whole season or they didn't complete the season. It would have fucked the money up. And if the league doesn't get money, that means the owners aren't getting the money. If the owners aren't getting money, the players definitely aren't getting the money. So I hate to use this term, but they're kind of like $40 million slaves and that they're forced to work in dire circumstances. And at the time, everyone was freaked the fuck out. And some people weren't, some people were like, it's just a flu, but motherfuckers was dying and they're still dying out there. So they had to say, I'm willing to risk it. Let's go into the bubble. They had a bubble in Disneyland, no Disney World, I apologize in Orlando, Disney World. They played the rest of the season in the bubble. Then they came out of the bubble and they're playing games in their stadiums in their hometowns now with limited crowds. But by the su- by the time the playoffs hit, they're going to be certain states and certain cities that are going to have full crowds, whether everyone in there is vaccinated or not. But they did it for money, Nico. Hey, all right. So you said that they're like $40 million slaves. And that means in a way. But what's with the I mean, can... why why are we at like Houston open? Why are we at Orlando open? Like why are we flying across the country for these things? Rio International Open. Like they just had Rio International Open and like the week before Sao Paulo went into lockdown. And like this week Rio's in lockdown. They're in lockdown officially by the government, correct? Yeah, now they are. 
uh, what are the rules of the lockdown? I don't you even know? know. I just heard that like they went down in lockdown in Sao Paulo, which became a financial responsibility for me. And then like, again, that the academy had to close for 10 days in Rio to see if they could get the numbers to go down and that the beaches in Rio are closed, like police are kicking them off. But like, I don't know to the extent, but I just find it weird. Like at the same time, like COVID numbers are rising, hate, like deaths are going up, things are shutting down and people are still like, yo, can I get some money to compete? Or like, yo, you fly down to Orlando to compete? It's like, no, nah, I'm not going to Orlando right now to go touch all these other people that have been around. Like, I don't know, it just makes no sense to me. I'm gonna pitch some bail for a few of the people that compete. Go ahead. Okay. For a lot of people that do this professionally, a lot of them make their money from competing or doing seminars. This is the truth. I'm not talking about those people as much as like the blue belts, the purple belts, just the randoms. Like, I, like I'm not talking about people flying out to fight to win and getting paid. Like there's Nagas, Fuji, Open in Maryland. Mm. Well, those are the, people the promoters talking. are gonna promote because that's their job. For people that don't have to do it, I'll be honest, like if I didn't get paid to compete or do seminars, I wouldn't be out there. I wish I could just sit at home and not do anything or telework. I don't have that luxury. But for people that are doing this just because it's fun, I don't get it. It's pretty crazy to me. You're just going to go out there and compete for for nothing virtually just to say you did? I don't understand that. I don't see any gain and you risking yourself getting it or spreading it to other people just because you like to compete. Like you just want to just raw dog the atmosphere and breathe and sweat on another guy just for fun in the middle of a pandemic. I never understood that. I think a lot of it is your value system. Some people are just indignant. They don't like to follow the status quo or don't want to be a quote unquote follower just cause like some people like the mask mandate shit, right? I get it. Some people think it's dumb. And in some instances it could be dumb, but some people are just bucking the system just to buck the system. And a lot of it is like attention seeking in some ways. It's like for clout. Like some people just say or do shit for clout. Like some people say, I'm not scared. I'm going to compete because I'm brave. And all you guys that are scared or are concerned are pussy. So, and it, I get that vibe from a lot of people's posts. I don't think it's necessary. I think if you have a nice government job or you in a position where you don't have to leave the house to really compete or do shit, I don't see why you're not just chilling. If you have all your needs taken care of and it's not a necessity to be out there with competitors, I would say just stay your ass home. But that's my perspective. That's how I feel about it. Uh, a lot of this stuff is unnecessary. That goes back to kind of how I feel about the game right now in my professional career as an athlete. A lot of this is just a game. Like, it's not that serious. Like, if you end up getting sick over it and or getting someone else sick, I guess you just got to live with yourself and think, was it worth it? You got to make that math in your mind work for you. But for me, if I had a nice ass job or it wasn't necessary, necessary for my standard of living to be out there and I end up being in a fucking hospital for whatever length of time or I don't have symptoms, but I get a family member sick, I would feel like an asshole kind of. <laughs> Not kind of, I feel like an asshole because it's like, I mean, we told you like we've been here for a year, like, and like in the case of people in Rio or Sao Paulo, like, bro, like everything shut down. You had a choice. Now they you're sick. Yeah, huh? I don't know. They're doing a lot out there because like, I don't know. They just seem like Miami. Just open. Like the shit like, don't exist. It, they it, act like the it, shit it, don't it, exist. It's like the difference. Like some people are like, even in Angola, I was asking because like, you know, I follow like like the business owners and I see like they're doing things, but like, also on like a smaller scale because like uh price wise but then i was asking like the people that train at gfc and i was like yo they're shutting down in real he's like yeah they're shutting down here but i got mats in the house so i was like all right so it is 
like, you know, things are getting worse there. Even though you see people or it just seems like they're out, like normal. It's just, it's super interesting. Have you gone out like normal at all no. since the shutdown? No, mm -hmm. not at all. Mm -mm. Now, the would you get the normal is that like, I know someone that owns like a bar ish on each street so i can go there but it's like empty it's just us but it's like oh we're at a, sitting at a bar <laughs> i get that mm. have you gotten the vaccine or do you plan on getting it uh i mean i guess i'm pre-registered for it like so i can leave the country i need to, i need to make a business trip to brazil and uh somebody's <laughs> getting married so yeah so uh but yeah, I'm not I'm like, I'm dealing with all this other health issues. Like, so the idea of like trying to like go through all the hassle of getting the vaccine and registering it, which like from what I hear has been like a real pain in the ass. But now I think they're just supposed to like text or email me. Man, you need to get that shit. Can I say something too about this documentary? No. Okay, I'll shut no, the fuck up. <laughs> I'll just shut up. I mean, this has been BJJ Goose Podcast. Leave it open to like, no, I'm like, like I, I want to add something. I better shut up a week. If I can mess around with somebody, I'm gonna do it. I need hey, listen, you can pick on me all you want. That's what most of my friends do anyway. Uh, <laughs> most of the people I know just bully me. Uh, I will say this about this documentary. It's a little melodramatic. I still suggest you guys watch it. However, I'll say this. Watching the way these athletes live and then how it affected them, I'm like, shit, man. Y'all really giving me like rich people problem type issues. Like these people are like, I couldn't see my kids. I was stuck in the house and like their house is fucking huge. I'm sorry. They live in America. Like, I couldn't see my kids. He's like, I brought a PlayStation so I could play with my son. And then they like peep over to his son. His son got a PlayStation that's in like a little suitcase, looked like something like Master Lloyd's son would built. Like, do you open up the suitcase and it's like a PlayStation with the screen? He is like, yeah. That's yes. like, well, nice, you know? Yes. He, the dude, Chris Paul took a PJ, a private jet, back home. And like, had, I guess he had like a guest house or something where he was like looking out the window at his family saying hi. And I'm sitting there like, oh man, like, your life is so hard. Like, so life is so fucking hard for you. Uh, there was a fencer that I went to college with. I think I met him before. I definitely been, like we went to co the same college at the same time, I've seen him around. I'm like looking at his apartment. I'm like, damn, like that's a nice ass apartment in New York City. Like <laughs> life is really rough. I'm like, damn, you guys are professional athletes. You're millionaires. Like I, I know that it's like, it was scary for you. But like y'all motherfuckers is balling and you're talking about like it was hard like motherfucker it was hard for us like the common man like what you mean what you mean it fucked with my self-esteem a little nico i'm like damn like right this is what it's like to be a real professional athlete like all that space right all that space like they're balling they're like i realized life isn't about money and the cars you have it's like spending time with your family in a multi-million dollar estate. <laughs> like what? Like you, they're like, oh, we didn't have toilet paper. Like, bro, you're so rich that you go on eBay and buy like the 150 rolls of pe toilet paper that are marked up tenfold. Like, bro, come on now. That's the only thing I will say about the documentary. Like they gave me rich people problem vibes, except for Carl Anthony Towns, like he did lose people, but everyone else, like, I'm sorry, bro. Like, uh, uh, life's rough it's real rough to have to stay in your mi million dollar mansion and shit and yeah. have your trainer come to your house in your full ass gym with all the ways that you ever possibly left in your little gym that's end of rant <laughs> i mean oh. but that, that's very true but that's that's all you ever see is the rich people shit and the same thing in the jiu-jitsu community like you know you only ever see like the gordon ryans and the dds and like when shit popped off with like black lives matter and, and george floyd like none of those people were saying anything about it a lot of people had things to say or a lot of people were just kind of processing their own way but like you don't you only see what like the media shows you so it's like Definitely what you see is the rich people problems. That's why I'll talk all the shit in the world about people like competing, but you know, the people in Rio, they're still competing. But I was like, yo, they came from the bottom. They've been fucked. They've been had nothing. Like you guys are experiencing it now for the first time. This is their every day. Welcome to their world. And yeah, I'm gonna pray for them to compete because they want to. And they deserve to like 
have some kind of release like because nobody was helping them at the beginning of the pandemic so whatever they're out there and reopen how do you how did the pan like how did like we done a lot this last year as a collective that says is bjj goons how did the pandemic affect you in that shutdown like how did it affect you how did it change from when it started to now like how did it change you like affect your life i mean it impacted everything like I always try, like, I couldn't compete or travel. So, like, on top of just competing, I just, like, work at competition. So, uh, that shut down, like, one aspect. Um, I can't travel to Brazil to, like, do any business. So, uh, that's been really hard, like, trying to manage the business and not being able to either go there or have them come here. Um, so, that's really slowed things down and forced me mm -hmm. to, like, really find people and find ways to like work around that and like really have to develop relationships with people because like mistrust is inherent in all business and especially in the favela and you know so that's been really interesting like on the nice side like one benefit for me was like because I am a teacher like and I don't actually have to go to work or commute like it's given me a lot of time to like focus on all the other business stuff so like uh I mean, I've made more money this year than I have in like the last five years. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what's up. Uh, yeah, but like, it, it's also been very stressful. Like, cause this whole time, like, on top of me making my own money, which I'm keeping my damn self. Um, uh, well, I kind of invested in business. You know, like I've had to produce the money for the nonprofit. You know, I've held down. I've paid thousands of dollars in salaries to people that we never paid before, like because they had no other way to make money. Um, and like that stressed me out. Like I had eye surgery and I had to like lay face down and I was laying face down with like a computer on the ground like this. And I built the Today Kids Project website, todaykidsproject.org, built right after my surgery because we needed money for something and the website wasn't good enough. Like, so that was like legit the day after eye surgery, you know? Uh, but like, I'm also like with my with the money I just got from the government, like that's in a savings account. So I hired a, set, a personal assistant for six months. I also had to pay out a double salary to somebody in Sao Paulo that lost their job. And I was able to do that easily. They're building somebody's house and I was able to send them a couple hundred dollars easily. Like I've spent like a thousand dollars maybe helping somebody pay for cancer treatments. Like all the money I do get, like I generally put back into what I'm doing so that these people can run this business for me. So it's like, the idea is for them to actually have like um, what they call like a signed card in Brazil, which is what you need when you have a real job. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh, I kind of went over what I how the pandemic affected me earlier in the show. <laughs> it made me hate jujitsu. <laughs> Just kidding. No, it didn't make me hate jujitsu, but it made me realize that I can live without it. And I think that was the, probably the most important important thing that I learned is that I can live without it being my everything. I got to meet a lot of interesting people, although virtually I got to meet a lot of interesting people. I was able to network with a lot of black grapplers and just martial artists and get to know them pretty well. We were setting plans in motion to have some nonprofit stuff going on with the Legacy Martial Arts Association. But I mean, we didn't expect a pandemic to last this long. We wanted to have something for the summer, uh, some charity seminars that could pay for tuitions for like sponsor young African-American kids to do it. But it's been kind of jammed up because different states had different rules. Things are just slowed down because shit ain't open yet. I plan on working with these people more down the road. I've gotten really good at podcasting, I feel. <laughs> I've gotten good at video editing or better at video yeah. editing. Yeah, yeah, you, you like know? it, you <laughs> So I'm learning. Uh, I, I was able to put a lot of things in perspective. I will say what affected me a lot was kind of like being afraid of dying in a way. <laughs> Like really, like it makes you yeah, no more mortality. aware of your morality, mortality. It makes you aware of your mortality. Uh, I, I I learned how much 
bullshit is going on in the field that I'm in, how many pieces of shit there are. Uh, it put everything in perspective. It's like, wow, there's a lot of pieces of shit in this game and there's not a lot of representation and wow, there's more to life than jujitsu. There's more important things that you can do and you can use your platform for better. You know, uh, and I think that's the best thing I learned. Perspective. And I gotta say, like, I've gotten to to make some very important allegiance alliances with people, <laughs> as far as just helping me grow. Like I say, like getting to know you more has helped me on a professional level. Like I would have never thought that I would have a Patreon. Yeah, I would have never I thought that OnlyFans path, and you know, I had to snatch you right back up and say, "Keep your clothes on, Tim. Keep your clothes on." I would have never instructionals, but you know, <laughs> I had started like I had tried to do an instructional before it failed because, and that's a whole other story. That's good Patreon content, actually. I, it's just that I would have never seen this podcast through to the extent that I did without this shutdown, and I think it's grown tremendously. It's so awesome when I go places like I went to uh, I went to where was I this past weekend? I can't believe it. Maybe I have CTE. Oh, Austin. I went to Austin and people were like, man, I like your podcast. It's like, oh, that's dope. Like people listen to it. We're consistent. Like it comes out every week. And I'm like, wow, like I would have never done this if it wasn't for the pandemic. I would have never thought there was a light at the end of the tunnel of my athletic career or like there's other interests that I can do if it wasn't for having to sit at home and sit down and reflect. So I think all in all, it's been a positive experience, knock on wood. It's been a positive experience, but damn, I really want to just get out there and just live life. I'm ready to do that. I want to go to Tulum. Yeah. Well, kind of minorly, but no, I am ready to be out. out. I'm just, I'm just trying to breathe the same air with the homies. I'm trying to raw dog the atmosphere. I'm trying to party. I'm gonna go to a festival. Like, I want to do fun stuff. Right. Get I want to do fun stuff, and it's not like I have to worry about training every day because I'm pseudo retired. But that's it for me and this pandemic shit, man. <laughs> Shout out to COVID nineteen for. Helping BJJ Goons become the best podcast in the history of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> I can't believe you just shouted out COVID. Okay. You know, black people, we got to shout shit out all the time. You know, shout out to do the shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. No, all just <laughs> dead ass though. Like, really, like, we made the best of a bad situation, I feel. Yeah, you got to make lemons. You gotta, no, you got to make lemonade. No, actually, in Brazil, what they do is they take the damn lemons and they just pour cachaça in it and they make that caipirinha. And that's just... That's like raw dogging, pretty much. If you're trying to raw dog some stuff, let's go down to Rio. No. <laughs> Have you ever I, listen, I'm not trying to catch the type of viruses that that will entail. I'm already I trying to a duck COVID. I don't roll as a person. I said, just get you a caipirinha, man. All right. Anyway. <laughs> is that slang for, a, is that some kind of slang? What's a, who's a, what's a caipirinha? Caprini is a drink that they make. I, I'm like, being funny. I'm being funny. I'm being funny, Nico. I've drink, drank a Caprini before. I'm just trying to make an off-color joke. Maybe I should save that for the Patreon. You need a mm-hmm. All right. Anyway. <laughs> if you want to hear more off-color, inappropriate, just downright dirty jokes, go to patreon.com slash BJJ Goons for all that juicy content that you want. Nico. Where can we find you? <laughs> All right, y'all. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at no new Nico or just look for Nico Ball. Um, and check out favelajujitsu.com as always. This has been the BJJ Goons Podcast. Peace. Bliss. <laughs>